Hello all, this is my review of episode 3 of Secret Invasion. I actually watched this a couple of days ago and it's taken me a while to figure out what to say. Stuff happens, but nothing really inspired me, so I needed to get my head in gear. As with the other episodes, it's dreary, humourless, pretty badly written, although there are a couple of good scenes. I think the writers are thinking they're being clever, and maybe they are, but it all feels very pedestrian and obvious. There's a lot of tropes in this. Now, I haven't mentioned before how there is a constant undermining of Nick Fiore. And I presumed that was because they were basically going to do a unforgiven style story where he comes back as a broken man and regains his agency, to use that overused word. But this episode takes that and doubles and triples down to a massive extent. And I'll go into that in the spoilers because it's relevant to a particular moment. And there's a moment in it that actually made me angry. Again, when I get to it, I'll explain it. And I wasn't sure if they were trying to be clever or whether I'm giving them too much credit. But it just seemed massively disrespectful and part of a current trend. Again, you'll understand when I get there. To go to spoilers, the show starts at the base where all the scrolls live. And if you remember, the scrolls can live here as their true selves with their true faces. Yet yeah, they don't. I find that really quite odd since that's what they're fighting for. But obviously it's a budget thing for the show. But it's one of those things that makes no sense within the narrative. They've decided that they're going to infiltrate a UK submarine and make it fire upon a UN aeroplane to spark World War Three. And the new lad who was introduced in the first episode is one of the people going. He's unsure, but he goes along. Meanwhile, Gravik is showing the members of the council the machine that's being built and refers to Super Scrolls and the advancement of their powers. To be honest with you, I'm not totally sure why a UK submarine shooting down a UN aeroplane would start World War Three. Maybe I'm missing something, but the UK are part of the UN. If they'd chosen a country that wasn't part of the UN, maybe I could understand it. And, and maybe you can help me out on that one. It just makes no sense to me that that would start World War Three, Especially given that they're Skrulls. They can copy whoever they want to and they could just start it without all this hassle if they actually wanted to. I flash back to 1998 and Nick Fury's in a cafe, meets with his future wife, doesn't realise who she is because she's a Skrull who introduced Gravik, although she's got exactly the same voice so he's clearly not a very good super spy, and she has the appearance that we see at the end of the previous episode. And again, there's a bit of this weirdness. He comments on her being beautiful, so he's attracted to her because she's adopted this appearance. It just seems really weird and a bit off-kilter to me. Anyway, flash forward. They're together in the house. He's made breakfast. There's a bit of a confrontation between them. And Nick Fury is told by her that he's abandoned her, etc, etc, etc. He questions her loyalty. And she kind of infers that she's back in the game. Because she was one of the Skrulls working for Nick Fury. A quick aside here. Nick Fury left Earth after the blip because he couldn't handle what had happened. He kind of had a semi-breakdown, so he's got mental health issues. And they're dealing with his mental health issues by everyone beating him up about it. Just an interesting thing about these people who think they're progressive. Little bit of hypocrisy and contradiction there. There's a quick scene between Gravik and Gaia, where Gravik's trying to find out if she is a double agent. And it's such a clumsy scene. Yeah, there's nothing else to say. It is terribly, horribly clumsy with awful writing. The pair of them go to the UK. It's one of the things in this show, everyone is jetting around remarkably quickly from place to place with very little effort, very little time spent. They're driving to a meeting where Gravik is meeting with Talos, Gaia's father. And Gravik takes a call, drops a word into the conversation which Gaia picks up on, and when Talos leaves the car, she sends a message to her father. Now, anyone with half a brain knows that's a test, that he dropped that in on purpose to see what she did. This is what I mean about tropey, it's so obvious. Talos and Gravik meet in a gallery in front of a painting called The Statesman of World War I, and Gravik starts ranting on quite loudly about the difference between statesmen who stay behind the lines and soldiers. 
He makes a point of pointing specifically at Winston Churchill and referring to his fat, smug smile on his face. The problem with this speech is twofold. One, as far as I'm aware, Winston Churchill was actually a soldier in World War I and various other campaigns. Secondly, whilst I know Winston Churchill is divisive, there are certainly some of his views that are deeply questionable, to say the least. But this was the dude who drew the line in the sand against the advance of fascism across Europe. He's considered pretty much a hero in the UK. And that's the scene that annoyed me. Not necessary. And I think given what's been happening recently, it feels like another attempt to deconstruct him. The two then go to the canteen and you've seen this scene in the trailer. Gravik's basically threatening Gaia. Talos stands up. Everyone changes into Gravik. They all sit down again. Gravik carries on with his threats and Talos stabs him in the hand, grabs him by the throat and basically is throttling him. And basically he does a Will Smith by saying, keep my daughter's name out of your mouth. This is actually quite a nice confrontation and quite well played. It's more sitting around tables and talking. But like the odd scene in the last episode, there's a sense of a real antagonism and a real passion there. So Talos leaves, Gravik removes the knife from his hand and it looks like he uses extremists to heal himself. So whether he's already been through the super scroll process, I'm not sure. It certainly indicates that. Talos is in a pub, Fury turns up and more debasement of Fury occurs just so he can get Talos's help. They're ringing Olivia Coleman's character and she's discovered the camera that Fury hid. She tells them who the commander of the vessel is, who can stop the attack. And this is the moment I was referring to. You know, you've already had your terrible husband. You've just had him literally have to beg for help. Obviously, in Captain Marvel, they kind of ridiculed his character. And in this next scene, they just destroy his whole legacy. Turns out he's just an average spy. He's smart. The only reason he ever got anywhere was because the Skrulls were feeding him information. So Nick Fury is a waste of space. Nick Fury is a nothing. It's the Skrulls that helped him become Nick Fury, the super spy, the spy's spy. I don't get it. I don't know why they're doing it. To quote Kylo Ren, let the past die, kill it if you have to. And this is pretty much what they seem to be trying to do. Another male character being decimated. And it's fine, they may do the Unforgiven style of him rising to the occasion at the end. But the damage is done. You've destroyed him. You've destroyed his legacy. So they go to the commander's house. He's surrounded by scrolls. They work their way in. Talos is captured by the commander. And Fury walks in with a gun to his son's head. Now bear in mind, this commander is a scroll. This isn't his son. Nick Fury threatens to kill the boy. And the commander releases Talos. Why? It's not your son. You're literally plotting to kill every human on the planet. Why would you release Talos? Why do you care about this kid? He's not your son. Makes no sense. The order's already been sent to fire on the UN plane and they're trying to get a password from him or his code to cancel the strike. Meanwhile, on the submarine, one of the seamen, <laughs> seamen is questioning the order and because the Skrulls have infiltrated, they tell him that they have to go through with it. It's an order. And he's questioning it all the way through. They fail to get the command code. Talos shoots him, contacts his daughter. She then goes down to find the captured human version of this person, finds the command code, sends it through to them, and then has to escape. They cancel the strike, and one of the scrolls tries to make it still happen. Meanwhile, Gar is intercepted by Gravik, as was pretty obvious, and he shoots her. End of episode. Cliffhanger. Nope. That's not what they do. They just drag it on. That's the perfect point to end the episode. I'm presuming she's also got extremis, so she'll be fine. I mean, the most surprise isn't she might be dead, but I'd be very, very surprised. What we get now is a very flat scene where Nick Fury's wife gets a call, goes to the security box vault, and in the security box is a gun. She makes a call, gets told to go to St. James Church in an hour, asks to speak to Gravik, and is denied. And that's where the episode ends. What a flat ending. You could have ended it on a cliffhanger. You could have ended it on a dramatic moment. But no, we get this. As I said at the beginning, it's dreary. There's so little humour in it. And I know Marvel completely overdid the humour. But this is bereft of any. I mean, I wanted a more serious tone. But I didn't want it something this dour. And just really plain boring. As I say, 
it took some effort to decide to actually record this and figure out what I was going to say. But anyway, probably leave that there. I'd say this episode was a step down from the previous one. Thanks very much for listening. If you've got any comments, if once again you think I'm talking bollocks, I'm always happy to hear it. Please like and subscribe and peace out.